Hello, everyone, and welcome to another RNA Collaborative seminar series. Uh, today, we invited our three RNA Collaborative Lightning Talks winners to present their uh, award winning talks. Um, and this is just a reminder that uh, there is live transcript on the seminar today. Um, and if you are interested in asking a question to any of our three speakers, please use the Q&A function. It's located at the bottom of your screen beside the chat function. Uh, this will allow our speakers to answer questions uh, after their session has concluded. Um, and it's just better uh, to use versus the chat. Um, and with that, I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, so our first speaker is Anuja Kibe, and she's a fifth year student um, completing her PhD at Neva in Neva uh, Kaliskem's lab at the Hemholtz Institute for RNA-Based Infection Research in Würzburg, Germany. Anuja completed her master's in biotechnology from the University of Kuhn in 2018 and joined the Kaliskem lab in the same year. Uh, there she is studying translational changes and recoding in immune cells in response to viral infections. Uh, and during the pandemic, she has uh, pivoted to understand the SARS-CoV-2 virus better. Uh, and along with her lab mates have focused their understanding on uh, how programmed ribosomal frame shifting and its regulation in the novel coronavirus works. Uh, and Anuja won first place with her talk uh, that she will now be presenting. So you can take it away, Anuja. But like most PhDs, I can't answer. What is life? Now, as a PhD student, an existential crisis is a regular part of our lives. But like most PhDs, I can't answer this question because, well, we don't have a life. So how do we answer this question? Science. Now, life starts with DNA, which makes an RNA, which further makes the protein that we all need. Or maybe perhaps life is a piece of cake. Well said, Plato. Now imagine the DNA to be a cookbook that you would like to bake a cake from, but you don't want to get the book dirty. So the recipe is copied on a piece of paper, which becomes your RNA. The amino acids are all the ingredients you use to bake the delicious cake you want. Now let's see the recipe here. One egg per try. As you can clearly see, I haven't baked a cake before, but bear with me. You can read the instruction. It's four words, each with three letters. When read as a triplet, it makes complete sense and so does the sentence. But if you shift the letter, there's not going to be any cake. This is exactly how an RNA is. However, instead of 26 letters of the alphabet, we only have four. Each triplet encodes for the right amino acid, which finally makes the right protein. Now, this process is called as translation. Now, like with the recipe, if you mess up the reading of the RNA, the protein is not formed you can say that it was lost in translation. Now the molecule doing all the work of making the protein is called a ribosome. It's a new day, it's a new RNA, and the ribosome is all set out to make protein A. Now every story has a villain, and here comes ours, SARS-CoV-2. The sole reason that had the entire world baking countless banana cakes at the same time. Now we've all heard that viruses manipulate a shiny new path, unaware of the dangers, our ribosomes start working hard on making viral proteins that form its structure. Now, the virus has not had enough. It wants more. A SARS-CoV-2 virus is actually quite tiny. It does not have enough space to have one RNA for one protein. So it came up with the idea to reuse part of its RNA to make different proteins. Now, remember how I said before, a recipe is read in triplets? And if you read the recipe wrong, it stops making sense. 
However, for a SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA, it can be read in a different order and it still makes complete sense. The virus has to ensure that the ribosome starts reading the recipe differently. So first, it adds something on the RNA that makes it slip, say a banana peel, and then a further obstruction like a wall so the ribosome cannot proceed in the right direction. Now in real life, the banana peel is actually a sequence in the RNA that is quite slippery for the ribosomes to translate. And the wall is a strong RNA structure that the ribosomes cannot get rid of easily. Now the ribosome has started translating, it slips on the RNA, is obstructed by the wall. But the sneaky virus has another way to read the recipe from where the ribosome has slipped. And the ribosomes unaware proceed in that direction, making a completely different set of proteins for the virus. Now, we as scientists have realized the importance of this wall and have now started attacking it with our chemicals. But you know who has, was already familiar with this sneaky attack of the virus? Our own cells. Now, using this wall as a bait, in our lab, we discovered a lot of proteins in our cells that interact with the wall and have harmful effects on the virus. The strongest of them was ZAP. We discovered that ZAP sits on the wall built by the virus and does not allow it to be built. Without the wall, the ribosome can still proceed in the right direction and make all the structural proteins the virus needs. However, without the replication proteins, the virus cannot survive in the cell anymore. You must be wondering then, why do we still get infected by the virus? Well, as Queen rightly put it, we are the champions and not I. ZAP alone is not enough. What we are doing in our lab now is searching for ways to get our body to produce more and more ZAP so that it has a significant impact on the virus. And we're also studying the protein more in detail to make a super ZAP, which won't allow the virus to replicate in our body. While we are quite optimistic, remember that this pandemic killed nearly 5 million people in just two years. We are working very hard, and so is your body. Till we come up with a solution, give it a little bit of help. Mask up and vaccinate. Thanks so much, Anuja. Um, while we wait for people to ask their questions in our Q&A box, um, I have a question. Um, what exactly is this RNA structure that forms the wall? Um, did you guys look at that specifically or is that something that you are interested in looking at? Uh, yes, so that is, so the RNA structure can differ in different viruses. So it's basically a stable secondary, any stable RNA secondary structure. So it can be a pseudonaut, it can be just a simple stem loop, but in case of SARS-CoV-2, it's a very stable pseudonaut, which is also why SARS frame shifts quite a bit. And we do have, an upcoming paper of our colleague uh, who's where they've done mutations in the pseudonaut and they're trying to see the strength and how it behaves and everything. But in this paper, we were just studying how ZAP affects the structure of the pseudonaut and in turn affects the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Is there a specific region that ZAP likes to bind of the pseudonaut? Like, have you identified specific nucleotides? Um, well, not specific nucleotides, but we think it is a ZAP binds at multiple sites, and we think that it's between the stem loop two and stem loop three. So it requires both these regions, but we are trying to pinpoint just the specific region it binds to. That's awesome. Yeah. Can you also tell me a little bit more about your super ZAP? Uh, uh, <laughs> like engineering, so how you're going about creating super zap? Well, I think that that was my dream. <laughs> but um, right now we are still in the process of identifying the exact binding site of on zap, which binds to the RNA and also on RNA, which binds to the zap. Um, but right, how zap works is that it binds and does not destabilizes the RNA structure, but it does not remain bound. So in my mind, a super zap would be something that binds to the RNA structure and stays bound so that it doesn't ever allow the RNA to fold into the secondary structure again. So uh, we are trying to pinpoint the exact point in zap so that we can increase the binding affinity. Interesting, that is yeah. very interesting. Um, so Charles Nader asks, 
is ZAP overexpressed during an immune response? Um, so ZAP is an interferon-induced um, protein, but uh, there are two isoforms. So the large isoform of ZAP is constitutively expressed, whereas the small isoform is upregulated during infection. It's also very complicated and tied to each other. Yes. Um, any further questions from the audience? because otherwise I'll just keep asking questions about this. Um, I guess I have a question more about, so this whole Lightning Talk seminar series was based off a workshop using storytelling um, techniques to tell talk about your science. Um, do you think this is like the best way or like uh, a more audience friendly way of communicating science? How was your experience with the workshop? So um, I think that communicating science as a story is definitely, um, it definitely makes it more interesting for general public. So even for scientists that are not in my field, so for example, Fabian and uh, Gabriel's area of study is not something in my expertise. So it was definitely easier for me to understand their research when it was communicated as a story, because I think the brain just kind of comprehends everything when it's presented as a story. And this was also, I think, the first time that my parents understood what I do, you know, for a living. So yeah, it was definitely very helpful. Yeah, I totally understand that. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Charles asked another question. He uh, asked, any models on how that accesses the RNA being translated by the ribosome? Um, I don't exactly understand the question very much, but if it is the, how it binds, um, then it would, so ZAP has zinc fingers, which we think are the RNA binding domain on how ZAP accesses the RNA, but um, ZAP has, ha, this is just a novel function of ZAP, but um, we, in how it affects the other viral RNA is that it just kind of binds and recruits exonucleases to kind of degrade it. So RNA binding function of ZAP is, has been known, but right now we just show that it also recognizes RNA structure. Not sure if that answers, but yeah, let right. me know if you need more details, yeah. No, I think that, so it has like this transient RNA binding, binding function anyways, but then it's yes. also doing this other additional interesting yeah feature of binding these ribosome or these uh, RNA pseudonauts to help yeah. with this. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, Janet Smith asks, how did you narrow down the ZAP binding site and does it have any sequence specificity? Um, yes, it does. Um, so how we narrowed down kind of the ZAP binding site is that we did uh, binding assays. So we kind of just kept splicing uh, slicing up the RNA and deleting parts of the pseudonaut to see whether or not ZAP stops binding. And what we found out is that if we delete the stem loop two, ZAP suddenly stops binding. So we know that that is one of the binding regions of ZAP. And we saw that the affinity of binding decreases when we delete the stem loop three. So that could be another binding site. So as such, we haven't done any sort of analysis to pinpoint the exact nucleotide sequence, but we believe it binds in these regions just by the binding assays. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome, yeah. Charles yeah. says, thanks, Amusia, great stuff. I loved your analogy with cooking. Yes, it makes, uh, I also agree. Analogies are great, and I think you did a, a really great job. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I guess if there's no more questions, uh, we can move on to our second place speaker. Uh, we have here Gabrielle um, Faber. Um, Gabrielle was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. And after finishing high school, he uh, traveled to Israel and enlisted in the IDF. And afterwards, he began his studies at the Bar Ilan University and he's now pursuing his PhD in molecular biology with a focus on RNA protein condensates, specifically P-bodies, stress granules, and nuclear speckles. 
I want to know more about nuclear speckles. Um, I'm not sure if that's in your talk, but we'll see. And I'll bring up the video in one second. Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to this lightning talk, where hopefully we'll talk about cytoplasmic stress granules and how we can use them to better treat cancer. So to begin, we have to talk about stress granules, and to do that, I want to tell you a little story. So once upon a time, it was thought that the only real structures in the cell were these large membrane-bound organelles, the mitochondria, the Golgi, but it turns out actually that the story is much more complicated than that. Because in the cell, we have lots of different RNA and proteins doing their various jobs, and when the cell experiences stress, it wants to collect all this precious cargo until after the stress has dissipated. So it collects them into these granules. And granules that come about in the time of stress are not so cleverly called stress granules. These granules have no membrane, so they're held together by really interesting biophysical properties. They, for example, behave like oil droplets on water. And these granules have been linked to many different pathologies. In our study, we looked at cancer cells. And if you think about it, cancer cells are always in a state of stress. They're oxygen deprived, nutrient deprived, lots of overcrowding. So cancer cells have used stress granules in many interesting ways. So this is what stress granules look like. These are immunofluorescent images. We see in our untreated cells, the, these are just three of the many proteins involved in stress granules. They can either be diffused in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. And when we induce stress, in this case, arsenide, a heavy oxidative stress, we see these granules begin to form in the cytoplasm. And for our study, we looked at a chemotherapy known as venerelbine or VRB. And when we treat our cells with the VRB, again, we see these stress granules begin to form. Now, to make our study a little more clinically relevant, we use a model known as patient-derived organoids. Now, when you grow cells in a monolayer on a plastic dish, so you can get a lot of information from that. But that, of course, isn't how cells grow in the body. Tissues have a 3D structure, which is very important to how they behave. So when we grow our organoids, we use scaffolding and give it a 3D matrix so that the these cells, these organoids, will behave much more like tissues in the body. And when we treated our healthy breast organoids with arsenide, we saw stress granules form nicely in the cytoplasm. But when we treated with, with VRB, the concentration we were used to using, we saw no stress granules form at all. But when we treated our breast cancer organoids, now we all of a sudden started seeing stress granules form in the VRB treatment as well. So this made us ask two questions. Why are the cancer cells behaving differently than the healthy cells. And second of all, can we leverage these stress granules to better treat the cancer? So what we did was we co-treated our chemotherapy with a corticosteroid, in this case cortisone, and this is something that's done fairly often. What we saw is that when we treat with very low levels of VRB, in this case 50 micromolar, we saw no stress granules in the cytoplasm. But when we added our cortisone, we augmented the treatment with the steroid, now all of a sudden we see a huge abundance of stress granules. But even more interesting is that as you increase the concentration of VRB, we see a huge increase in cell death that we didn't see when you don't treat with the cortisone. So what we're seeing then is that the cortisone augmentation to the chemotherapy is not only enhancing the rate at which the stress granules form, but also increasing the cell death. So we went back to our patient-derived organoid model, and we saw that in healthy tissue, we didn't see any stress granules, both in the VRB or the VRB and cortisone treatment, but when we treated our cancer organoids with the same treatments, we saw the stress granules begin to form. More importantly, we saw the cell death in the VRB and cortisone treatment. So why was this happening? So to save you guys the long story, we're not gonna go into all the Western plot and all the validation we did with immunofluorescence, but to, to, to sum it down, we see that there are many kinases that are active when stress granules form. VRB is activating one of them, the cortisone is actually activating a second kinase. And this second kinase is rapidly enhancing the rate of stress granule formation. But more importantly, and something we'll see in a second, is it's also changing the properties of the stress granules. One of the ways we looked at this was rinsing out the treatments. Because of course, when you rinse away the treatment, the stress granules are supposed to dissolve and the cell is meant to return function as normal. And we saw this when, this, when we treated with VRB and rinsed it out. After about 30 minutes, we saw these stress granules disappear. And that's how it stayed through the rest of the treatment. However, when we treated with VRB and cortisone and then tried to rinse out the treatment, we saw the stress granules linger. And this impaired clearance 
is something that's linked very heavily to many different pathologies. And we see that throughout the entire treatment, the stress granules are still there. And we're able to quantify this, and we see that there's a very quick dissolving when we treat with just VRB. But the VRB and cortisone stress granules, those linger much more. And there's something about the biophysical properties of the stress granule that's changing, that's causing this impaired clearance, which is very heavily linked to the cell death. So just to go back to what we had seen before, we see that by better understanding the molecular mechanisms of the stress granule formation, we can not only enhance the chemosensitivity of the cancer cells, but hopefully also improve patient outcomes. So thank you very much for listening. Awesome. Thank you um, for that. And I'm going to open up questions for uh, Gabe in the chat. Um, first, I'm going to ask you, Gabe, uh, talking about cancer, it affects a lot of people. Um, how do you explain your work to, you know, your friends and family or just like your neighbor or whatever, and try and make it easy for them to understand? So it's a great question. I think it's actually something that I'm not terribly good at. Um, but I think one thing I try to impress upon people is how, you know, we talk about cancer in very grand terms. And it's important, you know, when we're telling the narrative of cancer and how it affects people globally. But I think it's always kind of important to, you know, zoom down and try to get people to understand that there's actually a molecular mechanism involved. And sometimes what can make a cancer you know, chemo resistant or more aggressive can often be very, very small things. And I think that um, when people understand how things on the molecular level and the RNA level, you know, can actually have hugely outsized impacts, you know, when put what people would expect. So um, I don't know that I, I think actually the workshop helps me a lot actually in kind of telling the story better. Um, but I think that that's kind of the message I try to impart to people. And if I can do that well, I think oftentimes it's really exciting. So we have uh, from Preeti, uh, why were breast organoids chosen? Um, and was it tested with other systems as well? So it's a great question. Um, we looked at um, lung organoids also. The reason why we chose breast cancer organoids was because we actually were able to take healthy tissue and cancer tissue from the same patient. Uh, maybe I didn't clarify that. So um, we do have lots of different organoids um, from, you know, different tissue samples, but it was cool to look at, again, the same person actually just, uh, you know, different tissue uh, coming from the same patient. So that was a real advantage. Yeah, I'm sure that's, e that's much easier. You have a built-in control group right there, right? Um, so Charles asks again, uh, VRB seems to increase phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, so cap dependent translation initiation is likely stopped. Is this sufficient for cell death or are the stress granules required? So, uh, this is a big question uh, that the reviewers really um, were interested in because, of course, you know, phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha is connected to lots of different processes. If anyone, any of the uh, attendees, you know, that's probably something that, you know, oh, I know what that is. Um, so first of all, it, this is actually only like one arm of stress granule formation. Um, there's sort of two different legs. This is the integrated stress response, which deals with the, uh, the EIF2 alpha. Um, one thing, at least for this mechanism, why we are um, pretty convinced that it is stress granule dependent is because in knockout cells that can't form stress granules, so we actually see a huge change in the cell death mechanism. And um, there's lots and lots and lots more cell survival in the cells that can't form the stress granules. So um, although you know, stress granules in some way are just sort of a diagnostic tool to describe what's happening in the cell, um, it does seem to be that the fact that these granules have very heavy impaired clearance, and we saw this also through a few other ways, but you know, most convincingly just looking at, um, you know, a live cell movie, how they don't disappear. So, um, and like I said, when, they, when, they, when those stress granules can't form, we actually don't see the same levels of cell death. Um, it does give a pretty strong indication that the stress granules are um, an active part of the process as opposed to just describing what's happening in some other cell death, you know, you know, category. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we have more questions. Do you see any difference of stress granule volume between the BRB and BBR or BRB positive control since the form formation of stress granules has different stages? Uh, yes, so there's a huge body of work actually that looks at these. Uh, so what BRB does is it uh, breaks apart the microtubules. So that's the way the chemotherapy works. And when that happens, the there's no network um, for the stress granules to nucleate on. So oftentimes they are sort of spread out to the periphery of the cell and they're much smaller. So it is true that the, you know, the, the early stages of nucleation can occur. Um, and we looked actually pretty heavily at this. Some of my other projects actually work on some of the super resolution microscopy of early stress granule formation. So that is not impaired in the VRB and cortisone, um, but or, or, sorry, in either of the treatments. But um, in general, the stress granules themselves are a little bit different than the stress granules people are used to seeing. Um, so that's, the, that's how all VRB stress granules look as compared to sort of the other families. Um, as compared between the VRB and the VRB and cortisone treatments, um, no, they, they um, in terms of size and abundance, uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the cortisone enhances the treatment, but the, the overall stress granule properties seem to be the same. Awesome. Um, and then what does cortisone induced GCN2 activation do that is different than the VRB induced per activation? Oh, that's a, a great question. Um, that's like a little deeper into the mechanism that we unfortunately uh, have not been able to go yet. There are people in the lab who are working on this currently. Um, so we're, we're not actually, so what we're looking at is um, different protein recruitment. You know, does that, are the the individual factors inside, you know, trapped inside the granule are a little bit different now that there's this other active kinase. Um, we, you know, we're looking at some other kind of uh, modifications, but we have in terms of what the, you know, what is the sort of the deeper part of the mechanism that the GCN2 activation is doing, we, we haven't quite gotten there, but it is uh, a current project in the lab. I just have a question because this is very out of my wheelhouse of things that I've ever done in the lab. But how do you actually grow the organelles? And also, how do you have the microscope and the cameras to look at them? Oh, so um, I, I don't do the, the actual growing. Uh, we have a uh, like sort of a postdoc who uh, works at the hospital nearby, right near the university. And she's the one who deals with the samples. Um, I know that, like I said, she has to like kind of build a scaffolding and like a, like a 3D matrix that the, to sort of you know, help them grow you know, uh, vertically. Um, in terms of the microscope, so um, these are confocal images. Um, they, you know, when you use, getting it a little bit into like the physics of it, but when you use like a wide field microscope, it lights up the whole field at the same time, whereas a confocal, you can sort of, you know, pinpoint, you know, layer by layer, you know, you know pixel by pixel what you're lighting up. And if you light it, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't image well uh, in the, the non-confocal microscope. And you also have to use the lens that's far enough away um, to like, give yourself enough working distance to, to capture the whole thing. So it is a little bit more challenging than just imaging on a slide, um, but it's not, not terribly complicated. But And it gives you cool images like that. Yeah, yeah. And then afterwards, you can take those to like, you know, uh, we use the MR software, but there's lots of 3D rendering software, and you can kind of see how they cluster together. It's, it's really cool. That is cool. Um, oh, one more question from Charles. So do can cancer cells form more stress granules of different sizes compared to normal cells? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I don't think so. Um, I think in terms of size, they, they're uh, relatively the same. Um, I just thought the cancer cells, again, are, are using them in sort of more clever ways because they're experiencing different cellular stresses than, than, than healthy tissue. Like I said, in some ways, you know, you can talk about it that they're constantly in stress. Um, again, kind of the hypoxia, you know, nutrient deprived. So that's how they've kind of leveraged stress granules in interesting ways. But I don't think that the sizes are different. Um, but like I said, one thing that, you know, is an interesting feature when you're using these chemotherapies is that because they, they move much more freely in the cell because they're not anchored to the microtubules and they don't have those, those sort of bridges, those connected bridges to nucleate on, um, the stress granules are, like I said, very small and then they're distributed differently. So, so they, they, the, when you use the chemotherapy, then you do see something very different, but um, I don't think the cancer cells, the, 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 the sizes and things are, are you know, radically different. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we already did. They were gonna make <laughs> they really know. I'm sure you'll convince the reviewers. So yeah. awesome. All right. Yeah. Um, be able to do it, so. Excellent. When's the paper coming out? Uh, it's uh, published just uh, just in the latest edition of the Journal of Cell Science Fittings. Interesting. Awesome. Look at that plug. Go read Gabriel's paper. <laughs> Um, so if anybody has any more questions for Gabe, you can always just uh, ask them in the, oh, we have one more from Sarah. Have you looked at the dynamics of their formation upon chemotherapy and how long do they last? Yeah, so um, they, instead of, they, they do come about quicker. Um, so the, with, with the addition of the cortisone, we can start some stress granules even after about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, whereas um, the regular treatment, you know, sometimes it could take up to an hour. So we do we do uh, see the formation much quicker. Um, and in terms of dynamics of persistence, so we used a couple a uh, couple different uh, techniques. One of which was really interesting was um, uh, photo bleaching. So you if you photo bleach the stress granule, you look how quickly it recovers. So if it doesn't recover at all, it means the molecules are very stuck inside. And if it recovers very quickly, it means you know, uh, factors are moving out and other factors are moving in. So we saw that when you use the cortisone, the, the FRAP recovery curve has a much larger uh, fixed fraction. So there's a lot more of the protein that's stuck inside that isn't actually moving out at all. Um, so that was that was another interesting way to, to look at the dynamics um, after we, we, use the, we use the cortisone treatment. Awesome. All right. So I think we're going to move on. To thank you again. Uh, any more questions can be answered or asked in the, the question and answer box. And Gabe, I'm sure will will be available to answer them. Uh, and so our last speaker of the day is our third place winner for our Lightning Talks seminar workshop. Um, and that is Fabian Roden, uh, who is a PhD student in the Department of Chemis Biochemistry and Chemistry at the University of Lethbridge. However, he is part of the lab of Dr. Professor Hans Joko Wieden at the Department of Microbiology at the University of Manitoba, which recently just transitioned from U of L. Fabian obtained both his bachelor's and his master's degree in technical biology at the Technical University of Darmstadt in Der Germany. His research focuses on the combination of computer simulations and laboratory techniques to elucidate the mechanisms of allosteric inhibition in proteins. Um, and I also know Fabian personally, and I know he's really involved in uh, biotechnology policy, and he's part of Symbio Canada. Uh, so if you have any questions about that for him as well, beyond his talk, I'm sure he'd be interested in that, answering those as well. Um, so here is his presentation. Hello and welcome to my lightning talk. My name is Fabian Roden and in this talk I want to present to you my idea on how viruses could be blocked from gaining drug resistance through evolution. First of all, what are antiviral drugs? After vaccines, antiviral drugs are our second line of defense against viruses. Unfortunately, vaccines are not always available for every viral infection. And even if they are, they may not offer complete protection. Vaccinated people can still experience severe diseases facing hospitalization or even death. Furthermore, infection can have negative long-term effects, as a current example of long COVID shows. Antiviral drugs can help to stop the virus faster and reduce the potential for long-term effects. Now, my story would end right here if it wasn't for evolutionary escape. This is a mechanism that helps viruses to overcome drugs. An antiviral drug targets a part of the virus that is essential for virus production. A good target are viral polymerases. These enzymes copy the genome of the viruses. However, once a drug blocks the virus, this puts evolutionary pressure onto the virus to find a mutation to escape. A mutation that renders the drug unfunctional whilst keeping the polymerase functional, also at low efficiency. Due to the natural selection of evolution, only viruses having such a mutation will survive the drug treatment and will then multiply again. The bitter irony is that using antiviral treatments is also the most efficient way for viruses to become resistant against such treatments. The current method to combat viruses is to give patients a drug cocktail consisting of two or more drugs. 
The drugs target different parts in the viral replication machinery. Such a cocktail can often be sufficient to knock out the virus. However, such different drugs need to be developed first. Furthermore, a cocktail does not prevent the emergence of resistance mutations against the respective drugs. After having had a few cocktails myself, I thought how an antiviral cocktail would need to be mixed in order to prevent evolutionary escape. Instead of going after different targets, the cocktail would need to contain two or more drugs that all aim at one target. In such a way, the combined resistance mutations reduce the efficiency of the target to zero. This way, either the drugs work or the mutations are too much for the virus, leaving no option for evolutionary escape. So how is it possible to find out whether two drugs will be able to prevent evolutionary escape or not? I think it can be done via a method called network analysis. This is a computational method that can create mechanistic models of proteins, like the viral polymerases, and show how they function internally. To do this, one first needs a three-dimensional structure of the target protein. And thanks to science, such 3D structures are publicly available online. The so static structures are then used as input for the second step, molecular dynamic simulations. These simulations mimic real world and its physical laws to produce data on how a protein moves over time. In easy terms, I put the protein in a box of liquid and watch it floating around. In step three, I can use the collected floating data to create a contact map of all amino acids, the basic building blocks of every protein. This contact map shows me how all the amino acids interact with each other, and as a final step, I can cluster them together into bigger communities, like identifying several parts within a car as being part of a larger compartment, like the motor. With these communities, I can show how a drug, upon binding to the polymerase, creates a mechanic signal that gets transferred through the polymerase towards the active site, where the copying of the genetic information happens. A mutation allowing evolutionary escape must be along the signal pathway of the drug. The mutation interrupts the signal and keeps the active site of the polymerase safe. However, the mutation itself changes the overall dynamic behavior of the polymerase um, and can negatively affect the mechanics of the polymerase. My hypothesis is that combinations of resistance mutations can be used to achieve overlapping inhibition. If the virus develops only one mutation against one of the two drugs, the second drug will inactivate the polymerase. In case of the development of both resistance mutations at the same time, the combined structural changes could themselves turn the active site into an inactive state. Therefore, there's no way for evolutionary escape. And in my research, I want to establish a pipeline to identify whether and which combinations of resistance mutations turn the polymerase inactive. So what's the point? If successful, my research method can be used to create mechanistic models of potential drug targets and then identify where drugs could bind and how they work, all from the comfort of my computer. Then the potential for overlapping inhibition can be assessed and the drug development can focus on developing drugs that prevent evolutionary escape. This way, only one drug cocktail needs to be produced for every new virus and will always work. With such a cocktail, the next pandemic can come. Thanks for your attention. Awesome. Thanks, Fabian. Um, I'm going to pose the same question to you of how you think that the workshop really helps um, talk about your research uh, to various different audience groups. I would say, for me personally, the, the biggest experience was to see or like to really detailedly have elaborated that there is no clear answer like for example when i watched the videos my two favorite ones were also the ones here that are number one and number two but when i also watched them i knew that i liked them both the same i liked them both the most and apparently whoever judged that thought the same but when i actually looked at them and tried to figure out why i liked them so much i had to realize that they're completely different right the first one is very nice and <laughs> as anuka said her parents for the first time understood what she's saying because she talks about cakes and Play-Doh and has a skateboarding ribosome and everything. Whereas Gabrielle shows a lot of uh, scientific details and like, you know, the real images and everything where I know my parents would be completely out. So I thought for me, that was the biggest lecture to really see that there is no right way. And 
whatever you do, like someone will be angry. Like I know exactly in my presentation when I put in these Roman soldiers to exemplify this is a second line of defense. I knew that it resonates with people and they all love it. And I knew that my professor would would turn my head off if I would that use that in any other presentation because like that has nothing to do with it. It's not specific enough. And so I guess the best thing from that workshop and it was really good at that is showing like there's no real way and you really need to kind of figure out what fits your audience, but also your personality. Yeah, it's uh, it's skills. And I think that you constantly have to be updating your skills and learning from others around you. And yeah, so I hope that more people have a chance to attend these kind of workshops. Um, so Charles has a question. Are you focusing on hot spots within cavities and active sites? Or are you also at the surface of the, or also at the surface of the proteins? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. So I would say I focus on hotspots within cavities um, because the allosteric sites I'm looking at are previously known from literature, and they. Um, bind other molecules like there's a GDP binding site and there or like the GDP binding site overlaps with two allosteric sites. Um, however, what I'm trying to do is, and that's kind of where I want to go at the end that it doesn't really matter whether it's cavities or surfaces, because there's a lot of research going on on how to find these allosteric sites. And that's really amazing and, and very cool. And there's progress. And what I kind of want to do is once you have these allosteric sites or you have an idea where you are, you can look at these, into the mechanics. So that's why I like to do the network analysis to look, okay, what happens? Like how is the active site connected with the allosteric site? And what would be really cool in the long run is to go the other way around to have the protein makes these network analysis and look from the active side, okay, where are potential allosteric sites? But I know that this is very tricky. So maybe to be to be more precise, I kind of piggyback on all that research on allosteric sites and how to discover them and use that kind of as my input to say, I want to have two drugs or two resistance mutations. I want to see which one works best. And it's kind of on top of that. I hope that somehow answers the question. I'm sure Charles, feel free to, to write it again or reformulate. I'm not sure if I fully get it. Charles also asks, any chance that this network approach can be used to help drug targeting of RNA? Um, in theory, yes. So the network analysis works with every protein and, oh, sorry, with every molecule. So you have a bigger molecule and you just define your residues or your atoms as uh, nodes in the network. So in theory, it will work. The exact scripts I'm writing and the exact, pro exact processes I'll do won't help because they work for proteins, but it can be transferred. Um, it's just a problem with a network analysis that they're very well established for proteins and or more specific the amino acid residues. And so there's just a larger corpus of knowledge. But in theory, any molecule uh, would work. Do you just need like a 3D structure for doing this uh, network analysis? Is that kind of where you have to start? Um, yeah, so you, so the network analysis happens on top of the molecular dynamic simulation where you normally have a crystal structure. However, any NMR structure works or if you if you computer design your molecule, like whatever gets you in molecular dynamic simulation, you can put a network analysis of, a, of that molecule on top of it. Um, but the other thing you would obviously know when you want to uh, when you want to use that method efficiently is you need to know the binding partners and preferably have a crystal structure of your molecule. It's let's say a, a large RNA and a molecule that binds to it. Let's say already a drug, um, in order to be really accurate. So these network analysis they can only be as good as the MD simulation. So you know, in computer science it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you MD simulation uh, the less accurate it depicts what actually happens in vitro, the less accurate will your predictions will be. 
And then do you, you're, I'm assuming you're validating all of these uh, in silico bindings that you're, that you're recording um, and you're testing them in the lab? Yes, yeah, so, that, so that's, uh, I guess five minutes aren't enough, but that's kind of the main point. So I wanna, I wanna use um, an already well-known system. So in my case, the polymerase of hepatitis C, a lot of allosteric sites, lots of known resistance mutation, lots of known um, inhibitors. Use them as my test set in the computer. Check it in in reality, so to say. So have in vitro the activity of the polymerase with different resistance mutations and inhibitors, and see how much does that match my computer simulations or my network analysis, and then kind of have a feedback loop to update that. And I guess that will be the main part of the work. So so far as the idea, and then the question will be how how close can we get? And my expectation will be. Um, it would be really good just to help to have like candidates for allosteric uh, for overlapping inhibition because when you when you look at that large range of inhibitors and the large range of targets um, like it's one polymerase or one protein from one virus um, in the long range it would be good to just have a computer model or a script you can run to say like okay these are all my drugs these are all my targets what would be like give me the top 10 or the, the highest scoring most likely to have overlapping inhibition so that you can save checking them all in the lab. And I fear we'll have to do something similar. Like I won't be able to run 200 activity essays, but I'll, we'll have to kind of tune it down to the uh, best examples of the ones where I, where I can learn the most of my system. Preeti just asked, would this approach work regardless of if the virus is a DNA or RNA virus? <laughs> Um, yes, actually it would. So the idea is one looks at one target in my case is protein. And as long as you can inactivate the function of that protein, um, the concept of overlapping inhibition would work. So if that very same polymerase would not come from um, a virus, but from a pathogen, like, I don't know, like some, some E. coli, some other virus or or even a human protein, the concept is the same. So the idea is really, you have these known drugs, you have the targets and you just want to try, to, or I just want to predict to which extent um, is the inhibition overlapping and do the resistance mutations um, block each other. So it actually just looks at the protein level, which my lab tests are then in vitro. So I don't use hepatitis C viruses or infect any cells. I really just look at the polymerase, my inhibitors, and how good can the polymerase do its job um, of producing RNAs. And that is that is all I do. So it's absolutely independent from the host. It just looks at singular proteins and inhibitors that bind to it. So, sorry, technical question. So are you going to... Uh like overexpress um, these different variant proteins and then just do in vitro transcription on RNA and then level measure like how much their RNA like manufacturing is, is affected? Yes, in, in okay. easy terms, yes. So the, the essay I, I use is called the uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase assay, very straightforward. So it's very old and this is how they, how you in the lab first test the efficiency of, of any drug that, that targets your virus. You see, okay, does it affect the polymerase? And later you try it in, in infected cells and then in, in patients. And I do exactly the same. And it's very similar to an in vitro transcription, just that you use radioactivity to see, okay, how much have I produced? And you just compare it to the wild type without, um, without any inhibitors or mutations present, and then you get your efficiency. Awesome. Um, I open it up for the last call for questions for any of our three speakers, because um, otherwise, I think that's pretty much it for today. Uh, so thank you, I guess, all again, uh, Anuja, Gabe, and Fabian for being here today, and congratulations on winning uh, our first inaugural RNA Collaborative Seminar Series Lightning Talks Workshop. Um, and yeah, and our next 
uh, RNA Collaborative Seminar Series will be on September 7th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with UMass Medical School, the RNA Therapeutics Institute. Uh, so keep your emails uh, or check your emails for an invite to our next session. So thank you once again and have a great rest of your day, everyone.